you see my Twitter here. Uh, so this is the thing I want to have a look at today. So let's go to the documentation. Focus ring utilities. Uh, let's see what this is. Ring. Utility for creating outline rings with box shadows. Ah, interesting. So it's basically like a border. Okay. Dark mode. Ah, this is nice. This is really, really nice. So this responds to dark modes on the computer, right? So, okay, let's test it. Uh, system preferences. I think it's on the general, isn't it? Yeah. So let's see what happens when I move to dark. I am on dark. Light. Dark. Oh. I was expecting their website to have a dark mode. <laughs> and especially that I'm in Safari and this will trigger stuff, right? So okay. But this is this is nice. So they actually listen to the dark mode that the operating system tells them. So you can you can have the website being dark by default. You don't have to use any hacks and any extensions. Obviously, if um, Ah, okay. So you, you'll have actually it's it's opt in, so it's not enabled by default. Okay. Okay. So you have LG dark hover. Ah, is this a new thing? Stacking. That's that's really interesting. I like that. That dark mode is nice. Extended color palettes. Oh, they have way more colors. So blue gray. Oh, this is uh, this is kind of a steel color. Gray, true gray, <laughs> warm gray, red, orange, amber, yellow, lime green, emerald. This is really nice. They have rose, so they didn't have rose before. I, I don't think they definitely didn't have uh, all the grays. I think they had just the standard gray. Uh, we didn't have any others. This is really nice. Extend variance. So enable an extra variance. If you like to enable extra variance, you'll have to extend them. So, so what does this mean? So you can create variance just for certain properties. So you have active just for background color. Interesting. So you enable background color for hover and focus. Ah, this is, this is interesting. Okay. This is, um, this is really good. Extra wide breakpoints. Ah, we have to Excel. Okay. So previously we had Excel as the maximum. So you can set the width of the screen. So you can say the screen can be a width of up to W dash SM. That means you can only take 640 pixels. It doesn't go beyond that. So this added to Excel, which is, which is even wider. This is nice. And also you can define your own device names. So you can say this is for tablet, for laptop, or for desktop. How do they determine the laptop or the desktop? Uh, it's just a different different size. Okay. Cool. Shareable presets. Ah, okay. So you can create a kind of brand preset that it can pass it around. So you can have a preset and that gets applied on top of your modules from this look like a package so probably from a package interesting gradients so you have starting color ending color middle color okay so from via to nice from purple 
So this goes to orange through orange. Oh no, this is MD from orange. Okay. So purple will be at small screens and from medium MD, it's going to go to orange. Okay. Ah, this is nice. This is nice. I remember back in the day, we used to use images for things like this. And it was so painful. Cool. So focus. I don't think this responds to focus. And animations. Okay. Oh, this is nice. So you can, this is nice. So you can attract attention with this. Same thing with pulsating. <laughs> Remember the jQuery UI library that used to do this? This is nice. Okay. Probably should be good to use it a bit. Okay, let's create something. Okay, let's go to the desktop and see what version of Rails do we have, 6034. Usually when I start a new project, I tend to look at the version just to make sure that it's the right one, cool. So, so this project will be for a companion server. Let's look at the help uh, because there are a couple of things that I would like to change. First of all, I would like to use PostgreSQL as the, da as the database. So the database is here. So it's dash D and then PostgreSQL. Oops. Right. So I'm going to have Rails new dash D PostgreSQL. And then I want to skip the test because I'm not going to use mini test. I'm going to use R spec. And then yeah, I'm going to keep the same thing everywhere. Yeah. I think, I think, let's call it the app. It's a joke there that um, runs in our Vonage Dev account. So uh, let's build this. Still building. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to uh, make sure that we have everything that we need and maybe just, just add Tailwind and see how it's behaving. Okay, so let's go into the app. What do we have here? It created a master branch by default. I don't particularly like that. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the instructions on how to change it. Actually, you probably should see this. Uh, there's nothing magic here. So I'm going to close this. So I'm going to create a new app. I'm going to make it public. I'm going to create a repository. This is the, the stuff that I wanted to uh, do. Now, oh, it doesn't have, I think I need to commit first. One thing I want to do before doing that is in here, I want to get ignore. And then we will add usually a big problem on the Mac is this the store that gets created if you use a finder. So I've added that, get status, uh, get add all. So let's let's use the command that you use to create. Actually, probably it's easier to just move up a bit. So I'll use this as a commit message, and that's why I'll remember what I have. So get commit dash m, then that one. And then once I have it, I'm going to push it to this. And voila, we have we have an app here. Cool. It's basically just a, a pure Rails app. So let's create Rails Generate controller. 
welcome uh, index. Uh, so it creates a, a welcome controller with index. So let's see. Okay, so I'm going to go in the root and define, I think if I'm not mistaken, it's like this. So if I start the app, my complaint about our database not being there, but I believe it doesn't complain about that until you hit the database. Oh, it does. Okay. <laughs> so Rails DB creates, and this creates the development of the test databases. And Rails DB migrate, although we don't have anything, it just creates a schema file. If we look at status, you'll see that we have a schema file, but it's empty. So if I open schema here, it's just empty because we don't have any migrations here. Cool. So the roots are there. Let's start the server. and load it up. Come on. Oh, Webpack is, is compiling. Yeah, one trick that I found uh, really interesting is to run the Webpack compiler in the same time. So if you open another terminal and go to uh, desktop, the app, you can run bin Webpacker like that. And that compiles every time there's a change. Oh, Webpack dev, sorry. That is literally just create the resources ready to be sent to uh, to production. But obviously, we don't want to do that. So, if you do the dev server, uh, literally every time you make a change to a, a JavaScript or any any sort of Webpack related resource, it um, it compiles. Okay, cool. So, have a local host. We created the welcome. So what we got was, actually, we don't need this welcome stuff, right? Because we got some files created here that we don't necessarily need. So uh, we don't need this one. We don't need the helper. So let's um, let's remove them actually before we commit them because it just adds extra baggage that we don't need. Right. So git status now has just those. Let's say root uh, is welcome index. Uh, git push origin main. Yeah, that's it. So now it's going to be in GitHub here. I have two commits now. Cool. Let's see, what do we want to do next? Let's add Tailwind. Let's go to Tailwind CSS and kind of follow the instructions. Uh, but once I had, we're kind of old. So let's see. Okay. So because we have Webpack in our Rails app, we have a package JSON that has the different dependencies that are added. So we need to add Tailwind to this, right? We need to install, npm install this stuff. So this will add Tailwind CSS, post CSS, and auto prefix. I will we'll add it here. Let's see. It takes a bit of time. As there are lots of libraries that kind of depend on that. Oh, interesting. Lots of deprecations. Um, I'm not surprised. It's just for me, it's it's amazing. I don't do much JavaScript, but for me, it's amazing to see how many dependencies you have in a project, just in a regular project, uh, let alone things like. React, React Native, or you know, one of the big frameworks. And for me, it's just in in a way you have some peace of mind because everyone is using it. But at the same time, it feels scary. It feels like, what if something goes wrong, and what if things just don't work properly? Yeah, it's um, it's it's interesting. But in the same time, things seem to be working, and everything everything works with JavaScript. So including. <laughs> including uh, SpaceX. Some of the software that they sent over in, in, in Crew 1 this week is written in JavaScript. So, you know, can't, um, can't complain. <laughs> so we added Tailwind. So we'll need to add it to our 
CSS. Now there are a couple of different ways to do it and uh, some people like to do it through the JavaScript. So let's create a folder here and call it CSS. And then in here, we're going to create the file application CSS. And this will have to be included from the application JS here. So, so I'm going to import an effective, sorry, if we go up and we have CSS then application CSS. So this will import the JavaScript generated CSS in, inside the app. And I believe in the package, so in the dependencies, you have Alpine as a dependency, right? Or maybe not, we didn't have it. So let's install Alpine as well. Yeah, let's add npm install Alpine. And if you don't know Alpine JS, it's just a tiny utility library that does a lot of clever stuff. Alpine JS. Ah, it was there. So it's a tiny, it's a tiny JavaScript framework that does a lot of clever stuff. And usually it's just things like this out of the box. I mean, this one is fairly straightforward, you know, how you, you do tabs. And you can do all sorts of all sorts of different things. It's just using the data components in tags. Sorry, attributes, not components. So let's go back here and add Alpine as well. Okay, so we have this done. So now that it's done, what what we need to do is to actually follow the installation. So once it's done, we need to, oh, we can create a post-css config.js file. So, oh, we already have it. We have it because we, we included post-css, okay. So in this one, we'll need to include pl plugins, hell in CSS, let's see. Yeah, and the auto prefix there as well. Uh, and we're missing a comma here. So things seems to be different here because the require is in a different way. Let's see if this compiles actually. No, it doesn't. Probably what we need to do is do it like this, just follow the syntax. Tailwind SS. Weird syntax there. We pass parameters in there if we want. And the same thing for, I guess the auto prefix that doesn't have any parameters. Probably Telvin doesn't have any parameters either. So we can just use it straight like that, right? So potentially we can just not do this either. So let's see how this works. Uh, this should start compiling. Let's try it again. I think it's it's a configuration. So probably it doesn't, it doesn't see when it's being um, re-added. Oh, okay. What's happening now? Requires post CSS 8. Now, this is something that I have encountered before. So let's see what post CSS 8 is. So this was from April. Okay. So did we specify the version of post CSS 8? It is 8. Okay. And here is seven. That's interesting. Ah, this full human stuff is based on, on seven. I think a lot of stuff is based on, okay. So let's see, what is the problem, okay. Let's go down the rabbit hole then. Okay. So what um, what is the issue here? This is not what I was expecting. Okay. So this is the uh, error that's happening here. Is one here? Ah, it's right at the end. Okay. So if you get this error. Uninstall Tailwind and reinstall using the compatibility build instead. Okay, so let's uninstall this then. Let's in uninstall it. 
This will take a bit of time, as per usual. I install it like this. So once the rest of the tools have added support, you can move off compatibility build by reinstalling using the latest. Okay. Fair point. Oops, okay. I think the the shell that I'm using it doesn't doesn't particularly like. Um, let's try and put it in quotes. I think it doesn't like those symbols. So yeah, <laughs> I think it doesn't. It doesn't like the, the carrot character because it's it's really strange. Cool. Let's see what it's it has done to the package JSON. So post CSS uh, added got a Tailwind Compat. Okay, that's interesting. And then what was the others? Auto prefix at nine. Auto prefix at nine. Okay, cool. So what we need to do now is to re-add it to the config, right? So make this a bit smaller. So it's so we need to add but basically what we had before, so I can do com command shift Z and redo it from the top. So that has the auto prefix and the tailwind added as a plugin. So this uses a different syntax for the plugin, but yeah, let's see how it's doing with the dev server. Okay, compile successfully. That worked. Okay, I am happy with that. Okay, the other thing that we can create is Kelvin configuration uh, file. Yeah, so we added this npm tailwind CSS in it. Uh, so this creates the tailwind configuration file. So we don't have anything. Usually, what I have is I have uh, the tailwind UI added here as a plugin, but we're not going to use it. Uh, we're not going to use it uh, now, um, at least. Um, I need to see what they added in in 2.0. What do we want is just for basic uh, Tailwind CSS in here. Oh, another thing we need to do is to add the HTML template stuff. So at the moment, probably I should use Firefox first of all. So this is the app, uh, but you can see that it doesn't include anything. And the reason for that is because it doesn't include the CSS because the layout is not including stuff. So first of all, we need the language for HTML. And then for the header, we want a couple of things. We want the, the character set. We want the compatibility to just standard stuff that you would get in a the template. Then we want the meta contents. And then we're going to keep the title. And then we're going to keep the tags. And this one. Okay, um, so this is one thing that we need to add. So this is the style sheet link tag, and this is the JavaScript pack. So what we need to do is add the uh, style sheet pack, not the, not the link. So we're actually not using this at all. What we're using, we're using this one here. I'm gonna restart the server as well. So I should have used the R rather than NPM because it complains. Um, Rails decided to use Yarn rather than NPM. And that explains that there. So it does the whole dance again. So it'll take a bit of time. Okay, so let's run it again. Okay, so let's have a look. That's really strange. Something is not loading. So, uh, did we add, oh, <laughs> we didn't add Tailwind in here. We just, uh, okay, um, because we had that error, we didn't include Tailwind as not our, our CSS. Right, so, <laughs> this is Tailwind. This process should, should compile it now. Cool. Uh, let's see. There you go. We have Tailwind CSS in there. But that 
blue doesn't work for some reason. Text blue 500, did they change the syntax? I guess what we could do is we could look at this index and we can make this bigger. So I can say, uh, oh, it's not, it's not style, it's class. Okay, that explains things. Text to Excel, font bold, underline. There you go. Cool, so we have Tailwind CSS added to, to our project. And yeah, that was that was okay, I guess, apart from this uh, post um, CSS. So what we run into is um, a lot of the stuff that uh, Rails has depends on post CSS 7. So a lot of the libraries have post CSS 7 in here. Uh, so if you look for post CSS, uh, it's literally seven everywhere. And unfortunately, Tailwind 2 uses post CSS 8. And because of that, you need to install a compatibility package. So yeah, so that's what we did. It's quite amazing what um, what they did in here. And I was looking at, um, I think the best thing for me, um, and I was going through the different things that they have, going to the documentation, what they have new, is, um, is this thing, dark mode. So they have a new system now. <laughs> yes, uh, well, brain, tailwind indeed. Um, we have this, they have a system now that responds to the dark mode from the operating system, right? So probably should make this a bit bigger. And it's, um, it's really, it's really, really interesting that they do that. So actually let's, uh, let's try this. I'm going to put it in here. So this should be, the background should be white or gray if it's dark. So this is my page. Dark mode is here. So I was expecting this to be reversed because unless this doesn't actually let's use um, an instance of Safari and see if this works. It doesn't work either. Oops. Oh yes, of course. I just remember that. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Well, rain, it's actually opt-in and this is actually, we discussed this <laughs> earlier. It's a dark mode media here in the config. Um, you're absolutely right. Thank you so much for that. So now it's kicking on the compilation process. So what I have here is I have a rail server running, but in the same time, I'm running a Webpack dev server. So effectively, it's, it's a way to speed up the Webpack recompilation when you use it in junction with Rails. And you just run it in, in a separate terminal. Oh, there you go. It complains. Post CSS plugin Tailwind requires. We had this before and we fixed it. Ah, uh, you know what? It did it because because we had to move back to Yarn. So Yarn is kicking a fuss now. So let's install it again, and we have to uninstall. Actually, we need to use Yarn, and I think it's Yarn Remove, right? So it's Yarn Remove. And then we need to re-add this. So this adds the post CSS and then the special compatibility package for Tailwind. And yeah, that's kind of what it was. Yeah, add. Oh, again, I'm using Z shell and it complains about that uh, cat character. So I need to put this in single quotes. There you go. And that should uh, install stuff. Let's see if this is working. Yeah, maybe. Oh, it's working. Cool. So that means we have. Oh, yeah. See, the dark mode is here. This is amazing. If I go and change from dark to light, there you go. It's like magic, right? So you can see the dark mode getting on. This is this is really nice, and all all that is is literally this bit here, right? Just trying to make it a bit bigger. So you you specify the default in the same way you would do with with any any other uh, class, and then you have a modifier, the dark one. So when it's dark, it goes to this. Yeah, it's it's really really nice. <laughs>
Yeah, so my intention was to have Tailwind installed in a Rails app, and this is what we did. So effectively, what we had to do was to add it to our package manager here. So you'll have, I've added CSS, Tailwind, and Alpine.js. So if you use Alpine.js, it's a small, it's a small JavaScript library. Okay, so uh, we installed everything. Uh, we don't necessarily want to customize it at the moment, and that's kind of that's kind of it. For the testing, I want to add RSpec and I want to add God. And God is a utility that runs RSpec. So when I go to, uh, to the installation documents. Let's get RSpec going. So we're gonna install it in our gem file. I'm going to make this a bit smaller and also make it a bit bigger this way. So we're going to, only going to use it in test. So what we can do is we have just the general stuff. We have development test development. So we're going to create another group. I'm going to call it test. And in here, we're going to add the aspect gem. So we need to do, actually, I can probably leave this uh, running the webpack. So I'm going to use this for webpack. And this is the server. So the server will need to restart anyway. So I'm going to do a bundle install here. So that installed our spec. It should be here somewhere. Yeah, it has all the different things. I already have it installed. So it just brings it into this project. And I need to do our spec in it to make that creates the, the initial stuff. So it has the R spec. What this means is you now have our spec. You can run our spec like that, and that runs all your tests. I don't have any tests at the moment. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to another project of mine uh, that I have, and I'm going to copy the definition because you can have a couple of different formats that you have. What I tend to do is to have this color stuff and format doc. What that does, it just displays it in, nice, in a nice way. So the art spec runs here. Right, so it's it's this thing here. What I also want to add is another gem called God that allows processes to run in the background and it only reruns the tests that I've changed. So if you have 20 different files with tests and you save one, it will only run that file, not not all of it. So let's see how this is done. It's the same way. Why do we add it to development? Uh, this is interesting. I would expect it to be in the test environment, not development. Maybe they mean something else by development, not what Rails means by development. So I'm going to go back to the gem file here and add it in here as well. There are a couple of other gems that make sense to have. There is one called RSpec Rails. This is another another good one. Actually, let's finish with God. Let's do, where is it here? Make sure it's saved, bundle install. So this is the, basically the NPM install that you have in, in JavaScript. And I think with a guard, you have a guard in it as well. I can, yeah, I can use the bundle exit guard in it. And this will create a dot guard file. This is... So in here, we have now a guard file. So what, what this means is uh, we can type guard and if you press enter it runs all the tests but i don't have any tests for now so i'm happy with this the other the other thing that i want to do is to add some extra kind of gems to this so one of them is called rspec rails which is the integration between rspec and rails it kind of makes things a bit more more simpler so it, it just adds a bit much nicer syntax and it makes it it makes it easier so i'm gonna add this in here I'm not sure why they added to development test. I mean, it doesn't do any harm, to be honest. Actually, let's move it under, under here. It, we don't really use it in, in, in a development environment, but just in case. The other one that I want is factory bot. Do you have to explicitly add RSpec when added RSpec Rails? I think it's a dependency, so it will be, it will be installed. I just did the step-by-step -step because I think if you if you add it as part of RSpec Rails, um, you kind of miss doing RSpec in it. So I like to do things like that in order, so kind of build one on top of the other. But I, I completely get your point, Pudula. 
So there's uh, one called Factory Bot Rails, used to be called Factory Go. And what this allows you to do is to have factories for your models. Uh, so effectively, you define YAML files that allow you to you know, load objects on the fly, uh, effectively having something similar to mock objects, but it's more like data that is used to create a new object. I'm going to add actually more. Let me add the whole stuff that I have. So I have a couple of projects that I've been working on over time. And this is, see in this one, for example, I don't, I don't have our spec defined, but it's, it's kind of implied. So factory bot is, is what I said, simple cov, um, it's, it's just for code coverage, uh, for testing coverage. Faker is an interesting one. Uh, it's, um, and this is, uh, this is why I love, um, I love rails and kind of a community. This is a, a random fake data generator, but it has a lot of clever stuff in here. So if you need random names, if you need random places, anything really, it has all sorts of different things like, you know, names of dogs and different things that they do right so if you do fake a create create a uh, creature dog name it generates different things at different time let's uh let's bundle install this and if you go to rails console yeah so you can see the different different random data, right? So those are dog names. <laughs> I think you can do like a hundred times. You can do this. I don't know. It doesn't work. Ah, it returns the, yeah. There you go. Lots of different dog names to pick from if, you, if you're in trouble picking a dog name. <laughs> One thing that you need to be careful with, if, if you have a, a data set that doesn't have lots of different names for example the name of characters or the name of the locations in here but you use it to generate thousands of different data that type with that data and the name needs to be unique for example for your model you'll run into problems so one thing that i found useful is when you have something like this and you want to use it because you don't have to use it but if you want to use it you can add a random prefix as a number for example Cool. So we added all the different things that we wanted. Yeah, so the guard file needs some details. And again, this is something that I refine over time, but this is effectively a lot of different different things. So when you run RSpec, it runs bundle RSpec. It requires some DSL for RSpec. That's why you have that integration added. And you have different files and you can specify what to look for and what to run when something changed, right? So when the Rails routes, for example, are changing, you want to run all the routing tests, right? When the, the app controller itself, uh, so the main app controller in, in an app that all the other controllers inherit from, you want to run all the controllers. And the same thing for, for layouts and, and so on. I'm gonna save this. So now if we run God, it should, it should say it doesn't have any files. So all of that is good. So we can now see what we have changed. Uh, let's do another git status. Yeah, that looks all good. Our spec and God, uh, actually, you know, test environment, let's call it, because we had more. get push origin main. So let's create a couple of screens. So we have this welcome stuff. So what we can create, let's call it setup. And then this will be welcome setup. And let's call it setup. And this will be effectively, it will become, when you reference the code, it will become setup underscore path. And that's how you link to it. Actually, we can probably link it from the index file. Index mod. You can say here, link to, actually I'm missing the opening setup. And it's for setup path. That's how Rails does it. And maybe put it in a paragraph as well so it's easier to see 
we need to start the server here. So now if I go to, if it loads, I'm going to close this. If you go to setup, it will display the setup, but you don't have the action. So what, what it means is you don't have in the welcome. So um, the way Rails is structured, you have this, it's, it's an MVC framework basically. So you have the app, which includes a lot of stuff and you have controllers, you have the models and you have the views. So in controllers, you have a welcome. So we're missing an about, but um, the beauty about Rails is it doesn't really care about this as long as you provide a view. So if we create a new file here and name it about what they should, did we call it about or setup? I said setup, right? Setup, html.erb. Let's build this. This will be the setup page. So I just want to ensure that it's working. So we can start building the, the interface. And this is where Tailwind is really, really nice. All right. Because you can do things like, you can, let's put an H1 here, setup. So you'll notice one thing in, that Tailwind does. It completely removes all the style from everything. So it's entirely up to you to, to add styling. And it's, uh, it's very easy to do that. You just do text uh, to Excel. Uh, text, you can say blue 800. So that makes it, oops, that makes it bigger. We can center this so we can say we want the maximum width of large and we want to be centered, right? So it'll be in the center here. Let me add a background so you can see what's happening here. Red 50. It has a tiny shed. So what's happening here, literally, it's, it restricts the width and it has different things. So now we had, uh, we had Excel before, so that's, that's a bit wider. And now we have QXL, uh, which is even wider. I think it's 1500 or something. Although this is, it's a bit strange, but um, yeah, it effectively just keeps it at that and that width. And then you can do things like padding Y, so at the top and bottom will be say four, and padding X will be eight. So you have lots of padding, but what's what's really interesting is you can specify pa different padding at small widths. So if it's if it's a small screen, you say it's two and maybe PX is four. And then once you go to large screens, it's the modifiers just apply on top of it. So now if you, if you look what's happening, the moment you go to a smaller screen, it becomes a bit tighter. Well, it should, it's not that visible though. Is, is my screen? No, oh, but it should, um... where is it? Yes. Yeah, this is one good, good thing about this. You can, it's very easy to search. That's right. It's not 2x. It's you can go. To, yeah, it's it's me forgetting stuff. <laughs> but you can. Uh, this is this is what I was looking for for something a bit more wider, so you can you can see things in there happening. Let's see. This could be handy. God, life reload. I'm not sure what I haven't come across this one. What does this do? Automatically reloads your browser when view files are modified. Oh, nice. I like this. Definitely going to use it. So this is similar to uh, Nodemon. I've started um, using JavaScript a bit and I use Node. And what I found useful is this Node mode. So I probably should go to the second link. And this does exactly the same thing. So you install it and run, then run Node, it runs Node mode. So the views automatically appear. Oh, thank you for this, uh, Padota. That's, uh, that's very nice. So I'm guessing this creates some sort of socket somewhere that, oh, it's actually using guard, which is a testing side of things to live reload something. That's nice. I like it. Let me add it to the jump file. So I'm going to add it in here as well. And we can do bundle install. Nah, okay, so it's using event machine. Cool. Okay, let me take this one, and this will be run in a separate window. So desktop, the app, and I'll put it in there. So I'm guessing it's just God, now that you did the internet. 
Oh yeah, live reload is waiting for browser to connect. So I'm guessing once this is connected, it will it'll automatically do it. Cool. On top of Tailwind, there is this Tailwind UI product. It's a commercial product. It allows you to see how they do things. Uh, so if you if you buy the product, you'll be able to go to this page, I think. Let me open a new private window so you can see the web page when you're not logged in. It's, it's effectively on top of the Tailwind and it adds some extra stuff in it and you get access to these templates. So you don't have to build them yourself, right? So if I look for forms here, for example, they have there's different forms. So I have a sign in here and this is where it becomes really, really easy because I can just go in here, just copy the code and drop it in here. Right. So now what I have is I have a login screen and it's literally as simple as that of the great stuff. <laughs> Obviously it's, it's a lot of magic. You need to add Tailwind CSS forms. Yeah, I'm guessing some of the validation doesn't really work here because you don't have that that plugin. But yeah, the idea is, is they provide that and you can you can add more stuff in it. But there's nothing stopping us from just taking this thing and and look at it and see what they, they have in there. So first of all, they have this image at the top that I don't particularly like, so you can I'm going to modify this and call it uh, set up your server, your instance, let's call it. One of the big criticism of Tailwind is the fact that it, it effectively replaces CSS. So if you look at this, you can pretty much go one to one to actual CSS to some degree, like justify center is just text justify center, right? B, BG gray 50 is effectively background color and it has a gray but what's interesting with this one is you can create things, right? So if I if I want to take this and create a little class, I can say this is form container. So what I now need to do is to go to my CSS file that I define in, in the JavaScript. And one thing I can do is I can actually, if I rename it to SCSS, I can use SCSS in there. What I need to do in here is also import it as a CSS. Yeah, sorry. This will do the trick. So in here now I can define like form container. And then I can use the apply keyword and, and put all this. And now the problem is it won't work because it has this different, this weird syntax, but this will do the trick. And if I save it here as well, you will notice that it's compiling probably here. Compiling now it's compiled, so you have the same class there, right? It's exactly the same thing, and you can create repeats. So right, this this is repeated a lot of times. So you can this can be form row, for example, right? And you can you can build things. They provide it like this because it's very easy to use. The other things that I want to clean is this stuff at the bottom. So probably it's this grid, is this div? I would say, yeah, it's nothing underneath it. So I'm gonna clean this one. We'll continue with this looks like a waste of space. Let's see, what do we need? Remember me forgot password we don't need. Because we're gonna set it up with an API key and API secret, right? So let's call, let's call it this button start. So that'll be just start and then this will be a secret. And this will be, let's call it API secrets. This will be API key. I don't want this instance stuff. This is the API key. So this will be actually what we could do is we can do a, yeah, this probably, it's not, uh, it's not worth the effort, but it's easier to search and replace like that and passwords. Uh, API secret. That's our uh, setup. There's a bit of a problem because it's quite lower down. I'm guessing this form container has some minimum age screen, right? So rather than this, what I tend to do is to add a margin to the top. Margin top, I'll put it, uh, no, let's say 
8, but if it's a big screen, I'm going to go to 24. And this is where it's going to fail because the LG is, is actually applied in a different way. It's actually screen and then LG uh, because that's the screen. And then in here, you'll have to define this stuff here. I need to tell it what class it applies to, right? So let's see if the compilation is still going. Cool. So now it worked. Cool. So what, um, what's happening is if I make it smaller, you'll see that. See how it jumps at the top? Also, there is a background here. I don't particularly like it. So it's this one. So I'm going to take it off. It takes a, a bit to install. This is it's actually why it's uh, why that um, gem is really useful, Pudota, because it uh, I you always have to go back and kind of refresh it. I'm guessing once, kind of I let that actually um, probably I can if I save this. Let's see if I need to refresh this one because now it compiles in the background, right? It compiles here. Now I'm curious if it loads, yeah. See, I didn't have to reload it. So it's actually very useful. It saves me a couple of uh, command R's. So thank you for that. Let's delete this because we set the one this.